In 1992, I was working at Po Hong Kong Day and saw the announcements for Ko Ti So, and I said, maybe I should present there, and I never quite got around to it. I, wouldn't it have been great to say I presented at the first one, and now here I am back again 20 years? I blew it. <laughs> I want to thank Ko Ti So very much for inviting me to come to this this year. Um, I was extremely flattered because I was invited to come based on a session I did on communities of practice back in 2009 at the American University of Cairo conference. The fact that anybody would remember what I did three years ago, particularly in another part of the world, was very flattering. Um, I would also very much like to thank TESOL International, and we are now TESOL International, because when Co TESOL asked me to come, TESOL International exceptionally decided it was important enough to have a representative here that they paid for my transportation costs. So thank you very much to them. Um, communities of practice is kind of an interesting subject. It's, I put it in the same category as action research, experiential learning, reflective learning. These are all concepts when they're introduced to us they're just kind of luminous. We get very excited about that. We say, I get that. I see why it's so important. But somehow with these concepts, it's, it's difficult to articulate them, to really kind of carry them through and say, what exactly do they mean and how do you implement them? Um, and here I am today. I'm going to try to do the best I can. I think, though, that um, Phil Owen helped me out a lot this morning in talking about his story about the young teacher who was having some problems and had confided in him, and then when he saw her two or three months later, she said, I've got it all down. I think that for most of us, we never, ever get teaching all down. Um, there's been a couple times I felt like I've come close to doing a perfect conference session, but I don't think I've ever come close to doing a perfect class. Um, Teaching is a highly creative act that's also incredibly interactive. And to make that work, we have to constantly keep reinventing ourselves, to keep it fresh, real, and to keep the motivation there to show our enthusiasm to the students so they get enthusiastic too. I suspect that constantly renewing ourselves is probably about as perfect as we will ever get in terms of being teachers. So. If you find any imperfections in this session, they're, they're only there to illustrate my point. They're not real imperfections. And one thing I'll tell you right now, just to inoculate myself. Um, one of the greatest quotes I ever heard was from Michael Lewis, who popularized the lexical approach. Um, Michael was fond of saying, if you want to forget something, put it in the list. Um, this presentation gets a little listy at times, so I'll, I'll keep that in mind. So what are communities of practice? Uh, Etienne Wenger, who with Jean Love coined the term, defines communities of practice as groups of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. How many of you have been in a community of practice? You're in one right now. <laughs> okay, what I'd like you to do is just take a couple minutes, look to your right, or look to your left, and see if you can have a discussion with somebody about examples of community of practice you have participated in. And if you've looked to your left and you've looked to your right and you still have seen nobody, you can carry on an interior monologue. <laughs> but, but keep it polite. Go. Now, I think that when we're talking about communities of practice, there's something important for us here to think about, and that is that some groups form communities of practice quite easily. People who work in crafts, who work alongside each other every day, who compare techniques and things, it doesn't matter whether it's carpenters or musicians, 
perhaps even garbage men, but they're working together, there's techniques. Those sorts of people tend to form communities of practice easily. I recall long ago and far and away when I did a tour in the US military, I worked in the motor pool, and that was definitely a community of practice. Uh, an example might be a group of mothers with children of similar ages who meet at the park and share parenting concerns. Might be office people who meet or, and drink after work. Um, could be gamers on video sites, and some of the game sites are absolutely huge. There's hundreds of thousands of members that get together and discuss tips and different things about playing games. But what they have in common is together they observe each other's streaks, strengths and weaknesses, and they see their skills in relation to others, and this is very important, they're building their sense of identity, whether it be an identity as a mechanic or an identity as a mother or an identity as being an English teacher. They share ideas to make work either more effective or less onerous. And they're engaged because they share their ideas of how to do what they do well. Now, personally, I've been engaged in communities of practice for a long, long time. Part of the reason I got involved in the leadership of TESOL on various levels is because I enjoyed being there talking with people and, and sharing ideas and getting passionate about what it is that I do. I don't think I've ever suffered burnout. I don't think I've ever gotten bored with English because interacting with other teachers has always kept me engaged. Now, what are communities of practice essentially? If you know the idiom talking shop, I think that's the best way to describe what communities of practice are all about. Now, what's talking shop? It's about talking what excites you or annoys you or perplexes you or confounds you about the work you do with somebody else who also does that work too, to try to find ways to make it better and you talk to each other about it, you get more excited about it, and you see yourself as being the kind of person that does those kinds of things. You share your ideas about work. Two heads can find a solution where one can't. You share your excitement about discoveries. I can think about sitting in my office with some new idea that came to me in the shower in the morning, just waiting for my, one of my colleagues to come in so I could bore them with it. You talk about theories and principles and how to apply them. And whatever you're doing, you're able to establish yourself as a player of somebody who understands who's part of that game. And I'll just note here as kind of a side comment to get a better sense of what talking shop means. One thing you never want to do is talk shop on social occasions. That's usually frowned upon. So talking shop is talking about the things at work that the other people who don't do that never want to hear about. And if you disagree with me, I'll be very anxious to hear you tell me about it afterwards, but I think on the whole, teachers don't usually form communities of practice easily. And part of it is teachers don't work alongside other teachers. What happens is when we do our work, we walk away from any other teachers we might have been talking to, and we shut ourselves up in a room with a group of very nice people, but they're not other teachers, they're students. And we have different names, so clearly they're different di discourse groups. And we often have to hurry home to work there to get the meal on the table or to correct papers. Uh, my wife teaches second grade, I'm a teacher, my daughter's in school. We have the most boring weekends of any family on the planet. We just don't want them. And because we don't really have a chance to work alongside other teachers and see our teaching in the light of other teachers' teaching, we often get a little bit defensive because, you know, we've been up here teaching for a certain amount of time and we can't be absolutely terrible because nobody's throwing rotten fruit at us, but are we really good? We don't know. We, we don't, don't have any point of comparison. So I think consciously thinking about forming communities of practice is really essential for teachers because sharing ideas about teaching 
and practicing what we do together, it's really the essence of professional development. You can't have professional, you can't be a good teacher without ongoing professional development. And where does professional development happen? It happens in communities of practice. Now, not a, communities are good things. Probably for most people in this audience, when you think community, that's a word that has positive associations. But not every community is a community of practice. A people in a geographic community may socialize, but that community, whether it be a town or a city, is not about what they do, it's about where they live. Another example might be an alumni association. The alumni association is based on a shared experience. You all went to college X. But it's not about what you do. You all do very many different things. And you may not have even gone to that college at the same time as other members of the alumni association might have gone there. So these are communities, but I don't believe they're communities of practice. Teachers' lounges are notoriously not communities of practice. <laughs> Typical discussion in the teacher's room. The students are. The administrators are. The administrative policies are. And it never gets to discussing how we teach might even talk about what we're doing on the weekends or what's going on in the family, but notoriously in those teacher lounges we don't spend a lot of time talking about practice. So, let me ask you, does this definition make sense? Since learning begins in social interaction, you can't teach well if you're not continually learning, reflecting on personal experience, learning the practice of others to expand your own repertoire, finding means to reconceptualize teaching challenges, and most importantly, gaining recognition for the quality of your own practice to be identified and valued as a teacher. That doesn't happen in isolation. Does that make sense? So, I'm going to test you out here. We'll give you some examples. And I want you to see if you can figure out, is this a community or a community of practice? So a group of middle schoolers, they meet regularly to play soccer after school. These informal matches have gone on for several years. And when some players get too old, new, younger students take their places. They have a lot of fun playing. And it's nice to belong to a community institution that everybody in the bigger community knows about. What do you think? Is that a community? Or is it, first of all, is it a good thing? Yeah. Is it a community or is it a community of practice? I think I, think I agree with you. You're smart students. <laughs> now, comparison. A group of middle school students who are passionate about football get together regularly. They play matches almost daily. But they are also very keen on improving their game, so they get together with older community members who were respected footballers in their day to share strategies, discuss training techniques, and learn the history of local football. When they play, they keep statistics on matches, and when they change team members, they often do so experimentally to see what different matchups produce. Community or community of practice? Why? Okay, very good. And nice teacher voice, by the way, too. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so before we were talking about a community of football players. Now let's consider this community. A group of teachers regularly meet for lunch. Topics are typically complaints, excuse me, there's an S missing there, about students, complaints about administrators, the goings on of their families, the trials and tribulations of daily life, they feel like they're good friends and they enjoy each other's company and sometimes they get together for a social event or an artistic performance. It's a happy, it's a happy institution. Community or community of practice? Okay. 
Now, another institution. Two he teachers hit it off well. Soon they began sharing teaching tips and discussing ways to deal with common classroom problems. They become interested in particular aspects of teaching and begin developing a repertoire of practices. Soon they get the idea of presenting their discoveries at a regional English teacher conference. Are any of those people in this room? Yes. Community or community of practice? Right. You guys are so good. Why don't all of you come up here and do the presentation and I'll leave. Okay, now let's talk. You know, classrooms can be communities of practice too. It's a little trickier, but it can be done. It can be a place where everybody focuses on the craft of whatever it is the students are learning. So, here's one situation. The teacher is taught for years. She begins every class with an icebreaker so that students get to know each other. She states expectations that she has for the class. Then she launches an activity where students decide on the rules for her class. She knows that learning is best when it's done as discovery, so she sets up situations for students to ask questions and reflect on what they know about an activity before doing it. There is much group work, so it must be an EFL class, uh, and every member is a, ha, of every group has a role. Students are encouraged to respect each other. The class is full of humor. And if a student makes a mistake, he or she is complimented for taking a risk. What do you think? Is this class simply a community or is it a community of practice? Okay. Now let's look at another class where the teachers really respected and see if it's a community of practice as well. The teacher has taught this class for years. She is sure about the activities and the lessons that she has presented year after year. For her, teaching is a job and she has the routine mastered well. She is well respected in the school and students feel that even though she works them very hard and is not that flexible, they still learn a lot. She has little patience with student questions and feels that students who don't do well are simply lazy. While she gets to know the students who participates well and shows them attention, she pays little attention to the bulk of the class. And the quiet students who do, the, who do passing work slide in and out of the class with little effort. Community? Community of practice. Yeah, possibly not even much of a community. Now, this teacher is respected and liked, maybe not beloved, but it's, she's, you know, it, so it's not absolutely necessary. You won't die if you don't, be, don't belong to a community of practice, but it may make life easier. What are some characteristics of communities of practice? For one thing, it's very easy to get a second pair of eyes on what you're doing. Um, it, you know, just have somebody else sees it from a perspective other than your own. Expertise can come in many different types. Some of us are stronger in some things. Some of us are stronger than others. And novices are valued as much as veterans. Um, I attended a session this morning. Steve Gates was talking about issues of rhetoric working across uh, language, uh, different languages. And I think this is an area that I've been looking into probably a little bit longer than Steve has. And I don't think any of the research he presented was really eye-opening to me. But I walked out of that session with two or three new ideas that I never had before just because it was presented in a different perspective and a new light and it was an interesting discussion that was well managed. So it's not a matter of whether you're a veteran teacher that has all the expertise. All of us can contribute to making ourselves have a better sense of what our craft is. And I think teaching is very much a craft. All members receive willful respect because they participate. Willful uh, respect is a term I coined about four or five years ago. Um, in our classes at American University, I had one group of Teach for America students 
who were teaching in DC public schools and in disadvantaged schools and working on their master's degree in the evening. Uh, they were really nice, intelligent, smart people. They had a sense of entitlement that drove me right up the wall. You know, <laughs> they were going to take the Washington DC spring break and they were going to take, take the AU spring break too, you know, those, those sorts of things. Um, if, if they had a parents uh, back to school night, they weren't going to come to class and they weren't going to make it up and they weren't going to do the assignment. But I said to myself, I could let this group frustrate me all semester, or I could take them at the word. I could take them to be really motivated, good people that know a lot, and I would respect them, and I would try to look beyond the frustrations that they were creating for me. And I did that, and it was really challenging at times, but we got through that semester with a lot of respect. So I just said to myself willfully, I'm going to respect these people no matter what. And it was hard at times, but it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Afterwards, we wound up respecting each other. I think that's very important to take that kind of attitude into a community of practice. Engagement is dialogic, not dialectical. And by that, it's not the idea of a dialectic is, oh, Here's my thesis. Here's your antithesis. And they're going to fight it out. And then afterwards, you're going to have a synthesis that's, that brings everything nice and easy. But it's about a conflict. So the conversation in communities of practice should not be dialectical. It should not be confrontations. Rather, it should be dialogic. It should be so Socratic. It should be building on what each of us contributes, not creating situations where we learn something out of tension and conflict. Communities of practice should be something where the interaction gives us great pleasure. Craft is rooted in experience. So things like experimentation, demonstration, and rehearsal are valued, and mentor-apprentice relationships are often formed. This is very Vygotsky in here. It's the idea of, of mentoring in the zone of proximal development. But it's the idea that we learn together by doing, and we do, it, do our craft. Now, what are some common activities of teacher communities of practice? Sharing professional resources. Sharing classroom tips. Exploring classroom challenges. Discussing theory or practice in relation to what we're actually doing. Seeking each other's advice, getting feedback from each other. Uh, lesson study groups, which are at least a year or so ago were really popular throughout Asia, is a good example of a community of practice that gets together to improve their teaching. Action research projects. Preparing for presentations together. Mutual peer observation, and by that I mean I go in and I observe your class one time, and then whenever we can set it up again, you come in and observe me. And if nothing else, that contract that we're going to observe each other makes sure that we'll be very kind and diplomatic in the feedback we give one another. Because <laughs> if I beat you up, you'll certainly beat me up. Advocating for the profession. And just talking shop about what we do. What's in it? How many of you make as much money as you should be getting? Please raise your hand. Ooh, didn't do so. Well, I got one hand over there. Um, how many of you work hours that you're not compensated for? How many of you, oh, at least once have spent your own money on classroom supplies. How many of you have to have more than one job to make ends meet? Okay. See, things could be better. And a community of practice is one way that you can really get feel engaged about this job that sometimes doesn't always pay as well as it should, that sometimes asks you to do a little bit more. 
a community of practice can make you feel like you're part of something, that you belong, and that you care about each other. So I think it makes up for a lot. You can touch base with colleagues you know. You can meet new people with similar interests. You can rub shoulders with people you admire or respect. One of the things that's always impressed me about the T-cell community worldwide is that everybody's on a first name basis. And you can walk up and introduce yourself to somebody that's very well published or well known, and they're just, they, they, they act just like they're you, you know? I, I was so impressed when I first started getting involved in TESOL. You walk up to David Noonan and say, hi, David, and, you know? <laughs> so I think that's one of the things that makes it easy for us to form a community of practice, even though in other ways it may be hard. It's a way to gain new insights about how to understand a teaching issue, how to solve a problem. Uh, I'm working with Peace Corps now, working on developing a standardized training curriculum for volunteers in education. And many of our volunteers work in co-planning and co-teaching situations, which often can be psychologically fraught for many reasons. I've been talking to a lot of people, getting their insights about how they deal with these kinds of issues. and. It's, 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 nobody is going to ever give me, here's the solution, but I have a much richer understanding of the problem and some of the solutions. You get to compare your skills and knowledge with your peers. Um, Dave mentioned that once upon a time I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and I was in a country where French was the lingua franca, so when we were going through our training we were studying French. And let me assure you that if one of my peers started using a French expression that was new to me, I listened really hard and I tried to pick that expression up as soon as possible. I didn't want to be left in the dirt no matter what. On the other hand, if I heard another one of my peers struggling with something that had come pretty easy to me, hmm, that made me feel a little bit better. So, Knowing where you stand, knowing where you're situated among your peers is very important for maintaining your own self-esteem and to give you a better idea of what you need to work on. And if you're not regularly interacting with your peers about your craft, that's something you don't have. Have fellow teachers seek your opinion. How good does that feel? Boy, somebody else wants to know what I think. Get involved or get involved with an interesting project. Now, how do you make community of practices work well? First of all, participation is voluntary. You know, a lot of public school teachers, every Wednesday or Thursday or whatever it is, there's that mandatory meeting for your grade or something like that. That's not a community of practice. If somebody has to hold a gun to your head to make you come, it's not a community of practice. It has to be voluntary. It can begin simply by talking about lessons and teaching practices, what works, what doesn't. It needs to focus on teaching. You don't want to get bogged down in challenges you can't resolve. In fact, sometimes I've argued that to build a good English teacher association, which is a type of community practice, part of what you have to do is make sure that you're not just talking to people inside your institution. Because if the whole conversation is about your institution, it's very easy for it sooner or later to devolve into complaining about what's wrong at your institution. But if you're talking to somebody outside the institution, then you can kind of start talking about the craft and what you're doing and leave those institutional issues behind. And when you're interacting with your peers, the same thing as when you're acting with your students, acknowledge the positive. Try to use questions over statements. Value description over evaluation especially if you've observed one of your peers. Hedge your opinions, I think. Well, it could be. You know, if I was you, maybe I would. 
Now, the next part of this is much more suggestions and research. These are areas which I don't think a lot of research has been done on, but perhaps this is a time to do it. And I don't think there's been a lot of research done on cross-cultural issues and communities of practice. But I think that's something we have to look into. And so, once again, I'd like you to take oh, just two minutes. Thank you. Turn to the person next to you and try to imagine what kinds of issues, what kinds of cross-cultural issues might come up in communities or practice that might not come up if it was a more homogenous body. Go. Okay. Thank you. Now, being cognizant of time, I can't ask anybody to share out right now, but very sincerely, if you had some ideas about the kinds of challenges that can come up with cross-cultural issues, please tug on my sleeve during the conference because I'd be interested <laughs> in collecting those ideas. <laughs> some thoughts that I had on this issue. One of the things I had to ask myself is, how easy is it to talk shop if you're having to talk shop in a second language? And maybe that's something that we, we English teachers need to be particularly cautious about and give people a little bit more time and space. You know, if you grew up speaking this language, you can talk over a bunch of people that ha didn't grow up speaking this language very easily. Usually when we find descriptions of communities of practice, they're described as robustly egalitarian. But how does that work in cultures that maybe don't have egalitarianism as quite as strong a value as some of the Anglo cultures? Do you have something built in to trigger check-ins to look for cross-cultural issues so that you can smooth them out before they come up? Okay. That's the way that some people never change. Who sports to be in the range? Okay. Good. Well, see, that's <laughs> one of the things that you need to <laughs> build a check-in about. Again, who leads and how? Can that be an issue? Is there an established mechanism to provide discussion when cultures start to just chafe a little bit? Now that brings me into the broader discussion of English teaching associations as communities of practice. I think that communities of practice typically formalize at a point where membership grows to a size that requires things like members or staff to specialize in event planning, membership recruitment and management, publication editors, budgeting and finance, to manage and seek to the additional services that members seek. Now, I think what happens when you get to that point is that when you get to that point when you have so many members that when that happens, the English teaching association itself is not so much a community of practice, but there may be communities of practice inside it. And I think your SIGs are a good example of a community of practice. It may be that Cotisol has gotten big enough now that it has to focus mainly as kind of a management leadership body but that you can still have, certainly with TESOL International, the board, the executive committee, and the staff are making this whole thing work. That's not really a community of teaching practice, but in the affiliate discussions, in the intersection discussions, in the forum discussions, in the good work that the communities do, and if Richard Stoop is out there, thank you very much for your work with um, the standards committee. Um, I think there you still have communities of practice. So it's not that you've lost your communities in practice entirely when an English teaching association gets too big, but they're within it, they're not all of it. So one of the things you have to do to keep the community of practice spirit alive in English teaching associations is that decision making must be, must be much more mindful you really have to telegraph your intentions way in advance. I think sometimes associations can become wounded 
And for those of you who are T-cell members back in 2002, there might be one or two of you out there, back when all of a sudden we lost T-cell Matters, T-cell Journal, and then there was that one issue of TQ that was about 10 pages long. Yeah, that was a time where everybody, most of the members were just hit totally by surprise. Why did this happen? Why didn't we hear about it? I think many of us for years and years had been kind of going along saying, this is our association, it takes care of us. And then, what happened? The intentions were not well telegraphed. Nobody knew what was coming, nobody knew the reason for it. Worst thing in the world is to su surprise your membership. Check and double check and triple check on possible conflict of interest and even perception of conflict of interest. Sometimes just perceiving that there might be a conflict of interest can be as serious as whether there really is one or not. Remember that everything that you can do is not necessarily what you should do. Check your mission statement regularly and make sure that the kinds of activities you're doing focus on that. I can remember again back in the old days at TESOL conventions, there used to be a, a run with a free t-shirt if you signed up for the run. It was a great community activity, but it wasn't really, you know, you do enough of that and you start losing focus. Recognize varying cultural norms within the membership and anticipate their reactions in advance. Try to accommodate them, try to take them into consideration. Always strive for transparency. You can't be too transparent. And recognize and value reservoirs of member goodwill. I like the business model of goodwill, where goodwill is thought of as kind of a vessel of, of, of willingness to help out. And if you surprise people, if you cause them to be unhappy, you use up a little bit of that goodwill. And so you've got to do something to build it back and replenish it. But it's constantly changing. So pay attention to member goodwill. Do face work so that no one feels a loss of face. Build spaces where members can provide input and allow for, always allow for negotiation. Seek comment, buy-in, and validate and value all feedback. I've recently been appointed chair of a committee to review governance in TESOL. TESOL governance hasn't been systematically redone for about 20 years now. You can believe me, you're going to be hearing a lot about this community because we're going, we, this won't be like closing TESOL managers and TESOL journal. You'll hear about this way out front. Um, Establish dynamic governments. One of the approaches of dynamic governments is it's not who's for and against, but what is it that everybody can kind of put up with, even if we're not 100% in favor of it? Oh, okay, well, I'm, I don't entirely like that, but it's okay, okay. That way, it's not so much a matter of somebody wins and somebody loses, but everybody agrees this will work. Now, finally, I think that communities of practice can be wounded, and I know TESOL International in a couple times has been kind of in a wounded state, and it can take a long time to put it together. Let me say that when an association, when a community of practice is wounded, it's usually about trust. And when you find you're starting to have problems, like any good dip diplomat, in the hole, stop digging. Acknowledge there's a problem, Everybody should take responsibility for the problem because everybody did have some role in creating it. Everybody should apologize and then apologize some more. When I was working at American University, I used to joke that two-thirds of my job was apologizing. I think that's a good approach. Be sure that you accept the apologies. <laughs> the other thing, you have to mutually agree that the community of practice is worth repairing, that it's something you want to invest time in. And then if you agree to that, put together an action plan to put things back together. Think ahead, develop checks and balances so that it won't happen again, whatever it was that caused the problem. And look for opportunities not just to save face, but to actively build face and express appreciation for each other. There's my references, and thank you very much.